Hey, everybody. Richard Blissbrook here. We got hero call number 96. And boy, am I excited to introduce you to this lady. She has built an Arbonne empire, and she's been at it for a few decades. So we're going to get to hear a really epic story about how somebody makes a career in network marketing. I'm here to introduce you to Donna Weiser Hennis from Woodland Hills, California. Donna, are you here? I'm there here. I'm so excited. Hey, Richard. Excited to be here with you. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. You are so deserving of being in this group of people that we are interviewing to inspire millions of network marketers around the world to believe in what's possible for them. And of course, I have to start the interview off by telling the listening audience, quote, unquote, don't try this at home. We're only interviewing really exceptional people on the Hero Call. Don't you ever expect that you're going to be able to accomplish what they've accomplished because hardly anybody does. We're not interviewing people on the Hero Call to suggest that what they've done is what you will do. We're interviewing exceptional people to create a belief for you that whatever it is you want to do, you can do. And maybe it's just earn $1,000 a month. Or maybe it's not any particular amount of money. It's just to pay off some debts. Or maybe you just want to get involved in a community of people that'll up your education game. And you'll learn a lot more about you and other people in the world and maybe some phenomenal products. Um, or maybe you want to get rich. And you can do that too. Just keep in mind, hardly anybody does. <laughs> That's the disclaimer. But today we have the opportunity to interview somebody who has, and she went about doing it her way, a very authentic way, in a great company. She is a national vice president in Arbonne, which most people know is a nutrition and organic skincare company. It's been around now for, what, 37 years, Donna? 38. 38, 38 years, which definitely makes Arbonne a legacy asset income producing company. So tell us your story. So we like to start off every hero call. Um, specifically, who was Donna before Arbonne? Where were you? What were you doing? And then, you know, we like to narrow in on who actually introduced you to Arbonne and what did they say to you? And when I say who introduced you, their name is not important, although you, you're very welcome to share it if you want. But we want to know, how did they know you? How did you know them? What was the relationship? All right, great. Thank you. By the way, I'm really honored. This was on my bucket list to be on your Hero Call. So thank you so much for inviting me to share oh, with cool. you. Oh, cool. You're so I'm welcome. Excited. So I was actually, I've actually been with Arbonne going on, it's actually 26 years this week. That's pretty cool. This is my Arbonne anniversary. Well, are, is that what you call it? An Arba, Arba anniversary? Arba anniversary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 26 years ago, my kids were six years old and nine years old. And at that time, I was a camp director. That was my profession. I actually graduated from Cal State Long Beach in California with a degree in recreation administration. People are always surprised to hear there's such a degree, but there was. And I, I wanted to put my kids in private school. And at that time, my ex-husband's business wasn't wasn't really providing us that kind of income. And I realized if it's to be, it's up to me. So I thought I'd go to graduate school because perhaps if I had a master's degree in business, I could make some money. So at the same time that I was in graduate school, I was also pursuing an acting career because I was told I had a good mom look back in those days. Now I have a good grandma look. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a good mom look. And I, the bottom line was this. I was looking for a way to put my kids in private school. That was, that was really you know, heavy on my heart. It was my intention to find a way to get these kids in private school. And I'll tell you that whenever I talk about this story, I talk about, I always talk about the law of attraction because my intention was crystal clear. I wanted to get these kids in private school. So I don't think that it was a coincidence that I happened to be at a Mother's Day luncheon 26 years ago in May at the, in Studio City here in Southern California 
where an Arbonne consultant, actually two Arbonne consultants, had a table at this Mother's Day luncheon. And they were raffling off a gift basket of Arbonne products and a certificate for a free facial, because back in those days, I call it the days of covered wagons. Back in those days, we did self-guided facials to introduce the products to people. So they gave me a little certificate. I filled out a little slip, said name and number, best time to call. No, no cell phones in those days, no computers in those days. So the lady called me the next day. That's a great tip. She called me. She, she followed up immediately. I didn't know who she was, but she called and said, um, hi, Donna, this is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I've got good news and bad news. You didn't win the gift basket, but you did win a chance to try our products. <laughs> A chance to try them. <laughs> yeah, look what I won. Yeah. So my, my first reaction, not having a lot of money. I was driving an old beat-up blue Ford station wagon at the time. We were really stressed financially, really. There was much more a month at the end of the money back in those days. All right, stop. i got to ask you a comparison question. Okay. How many different white Mercedes have you driven in your Arbonne career? Oh my gosh. I've, had, I've been driving Arbonne Mercedes since... So for 24 years, and I usually get a new one every two or three years. So a lot. <laughs> I love that. But I have, the, I have my favorite one now. I love the car that I have now. So I love it. Well, I just, I have a recruiting idea for you. Tell me. Instead of turning them in every two years, just stack them up in your yard, like park them in the front yard. <laughs> there you go. And just leave them there and have somebody wash them once a week. That's a great idea. That'll be Jeff's job. <laughs> That's a great idea. So this lady calls me and says, you know, you won this, uh, this free facial. And I said, I don't have any money. And I, at that moment, I was channeling being an actress. I think I just got an agent. So I said, I don't have any money. I'm an actress. And she said some magic words. She said, I'm a casting director. I said, okay, I'll be right over. Whoa. Who is that? How do you like that? Who was that that said that? Her name was um, Beth. She was wow. a she was she truly was a casting director. Oh, she was. Okay, no. I thought she just made that up in the moment. No, no, no. She was a real casting director. As a matter of fact, she gave me some some lessons, and I, I actually went on an audition for Parquet Margarine, and she was the one that coached me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling poison. You were going to sell poison. Exactly. <laughs> I need to make money to get these kids in private school. So anyway, I tried these products at, at her home. I, by the way, I didn't have a lot of exposure to network marketing at all. I, don't, I hadn't gone to a lot of network marketing or direct selling parties. Maybe I went to a Tupperware party once. My mom had sold Avon when I was a little kid. Not a lot of exposure. So I, I thought it was strange that she was inviting me to her home for a facial. But she was the casting director, so I went over. <laughs> and so I... I experienced the products. I love them. I couldn't afford to buy them, but she was really very, she was a good consultant because she said to me, when are you getting paid? Cause I can call you then. Wow. And I said, yeah. And I said, oh, I'm getting paid next Friday. And she goes, can I call you Thursday? I said, sure. And she did. I tried the products. I cleared up my adult acne in gosh, less than a, less than a month. Wow. I remember there was a business attached to the, she, she actually introduced me to the business. Said, you might want to do this. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not doing one of those things. I'm in graduate school. I'm going to get a master's in business. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, but I remembered after I did try, I, when I tried the products and I saw the difference, I was smart enough to know that if the products worked for me, they'd work for other people. So I took a look at the compensation plan and I remember the day that I called her and I said, tell me more about this thing. And that's how I, I love started. it. And so what did you see, Donna? You look at the compensation plan, which that's about, I think, the least appealing thing to look at if you're evaluating getting involved in network marketing. What did you see, whether it was in the compensation plan or the other things that you looked at or what she said, what was appealing? Like what, what turned lights on for you? The ability to make enough money to put my kids in private school in the next couple of years. That, mm -hmm. that was, you know, and by the way, and because the products worked, I figured if I like them, other people will like them. Yep. That's good. That's a great story to tell yourself because it's true. Did the income projection come from the comp plan or something she told you? 
oh my gosh, I got to remember back 26 years ago. Um, she gave me a little brochure that had some information which showed the income potential. And I remember, I do remember that evening looking at that, no, actually not that evening. It wasn't until several weeks later when I decided to think about this and I pulled that sheet of paper out of the, out of the night table or something, wherever it was mm-hmm. hidden. And I looked at it and I said, gosh, maybe this is the way I could make enough money to put these kids in private school. If I follow the system and I listen to what they tell me to do, then maybe I could be the person that's going to earn this kind of money. And, and that's what, what did that, do you remember what the sheet said that captured your attention? Honestly, it was the money. I just saw that number. I saw that income potential. And at that point, I was so hungry to put these girls in private school that I just said, wow, it was the money. It wasn't anything else. And do you remember how much money it suggested you could earn? Yeah, I, I believe it said that in a couple of years, I could be earning, you know, five or $6,000 a month. Right. Like I'm and is, excited. Is, is that back then, is that what somebody with a master's degree in business would expect to earn? That's a good question. Um, probably less, I think. Especially, I was going for I didn't tell you this. I was going for a master's degree for a nonprofit, so I would have made a lot less. <laughs> well, I was just thinking. Um, I just had a person working for me who no longer works for me that had a master's degree, and she was making four thousand a month in 2018 Hmm. so okay um how did you start tell us about your launch did you have a as they say down here in australia a proper launch or did you procrastinate and mess it up or did you go for it well it's an interesting story because the person who sponsored me how can I say this delicately? The person who sponsored me, I, I didn't want to introduce her to my circle of friends. Okay. That's so interesting. I, I decided that I was going to shadow her for a week or two and watch what she did and then just do that myself. And is that what you did? That's what I did. Now, wow. I have to tell you that my very first presentation that I did at my home, and we did in, you know, in-home presentations then, I and I wasn't being coached by my mentor. My mentor is Sandra Tillinghast. Okay. Know. Yes. So that is my mentor. I, I actually was introduced to Sandra probably a month later, who mm-hmm. became my dear friend and, and mentor. This, this other gal and her upline, I didn't really feel comfortable working with. Right. So my very first presentation, I remember I, I invited my family and friends. And by the way, that was the end of family and friends for me. I will tell you that in a moment. <laughs> But I invited them to my home, and my ex-husband took the kids out of the house that night, so I had the place to myself, and I had my little flashcards so I could read it, read my notes, and we did these. In those days, we did self-guided facials. You know, we don't do that any longer. And everyone sat around the table, and I did my presentation. I was proud of myself. Remember, I, I was an actress. I could be an Arvon consultant. And I finished the presentation, but I didn't learn the importance of asking people to buy something so I finished the presentation and I said thanks for coming and they all said thanks for inviting me and they all left and I didn't sell anything so I cried (laughs) because I'm emotional and I did call I called my upline the next day and I said nobody bought anything and she said did you ask them to and I said no she goes you have to ask them to buy so that was one of my lessons beautiful so You say that was the end of friends and family. Why? What happened? My friends thought I was crazy. My friends and family thought I was nuts. They couldn't believe I was dropping out of graduate school, which I did, to to pursue this business. But I had such a strong vision that this this was the answer to my financial woes, to the children you know, being put in private school. I, I just knew it. I knew it in my heart. And I already had been exposed to the power of affirmations. I had already been exposed to visualizing. I read a phenomenal book by Shakti Gawain several years before called Creative Visualizations. So I knew that I could make this work and I was committed to make it work. So I didn't care what they thought. And so I decided to just get out there and talk to people I didn't know. So I built my whole business 
with the cold market. By moving cold market people into your warm market and then yeah. inviting them. So tell us about that. How did you do that? Because um, that's not how most people build. No. Uh, most people just keep working inside their network. And right. then, of course, a, what a professional networker does is add to their network by moving people from cold to warm. But most people don't actually turn pro for a few years after being in network marketing. So how did you do that? Like, how did you move in the world to connect with people that you didn't know? Well, I, I, I put together this, this little gift certificate. And, it's, and, and it said name and number, best time to call on one side. And the other side said free facial. Kind of what they gave, gave me at that luncheon. Right. I went out and about, and I talked to a lot of people. How and did I, you talk to people? So when you go, when you go out and about, Donna, um, does that mean you tapped people on the shoulder and said, "Excuse me, would you like a free facial?" Or no? You know, there's this, there's this bubble that we like to talk about that people walk around. They walk around in this bubble, which is, you know, don't talk to me. Don't bother me. Don't intrude on my space. And now, fortunately, everybody has this smartphone. They can, as long as they're staring with that, at that, it basically screams, don't talk to me. Don't bother me. And so we have that. But then those of us, we, all, we also have the opposite, which is don't talk to strangers. Don't bother people. Don't interrupt people. Don't be inappropriate. So the magic is how do you open yourself up? to appropriately and powerfully connect with people when the opportunity is provided to connect. You know, for example, if you make eye contact with somebody, what most people do is walk away from that. They make eye contact, but they walk on by it. That's like the opportunity is the eye contact. Tell us about some of the opportunities that you found being out and about what did you do about them to connect? So rapport was the key for me. I built rapport with people. So I had to, I call it warming up the cold market. So I did make eye contact. I walked around specifically looking. So I used to go to the mall like three days a week. I went to the mall. Now my kids were little, so i drop them off at school. Then I'd go to the mall. And I would just to talk. To, I, that's how I started, talking to people at the mall. And I just you know, start a conversation and I'd say things like, so uh, I'd be looking around and I'd, at some of the, their merchandise and I'd say, so I asked their name, so always important, I always ask their name. And then I'd say, so, uh, so Richard, how long have you worked here? Although I didn't talk to men in those days, I don't talk to women. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, how long have you worked here? And they would tell me how long they worked there. And I said, oh, wow, that's so great. So uh, what did you do before you were working here? And they would tell me what they did before they were working here. And I spent... A lot of times, especially because I'd always go to the mall at 10 o'clock in the morning, right when it opened, because it wasn't very busy. And I was prospecting the people who worked at the mall, knowing that they were working for somebody else, not making a lot of money, not very content. And I would just start conversations. And when it came up, because I, I learned to use these words in my business, I got to say in my business. So if I was chatting with someone and um, they, I said, so do you like what you do? Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's a job. And I'd say, you know, I'm really blessed because, you know, I love what I do in my, you know, with my business or in my business, I feel really blessed or fortunate. So I use those words in my business. And of course, then they would say to me, what's your business? And then I got to tell them what I did. And so if somebody said, what's your business, Donna, what would you say? Back in those days, I said something different than I say today, but back in those days, I said, I market a Swiss botanical skincare product line. That's cool. right. And I led with, with the product, by the way. Back in those days, I led with the product, not with the right. business. Right. And what do you say today if somebody asks you what you do? Oh, it depends on who I'm talking to. But, you know, some people I might say um, I market a vegan health and wellness product line. Or I might say, you know how people are looking for – more time and more money, well, I help people do that, or I teach people how to do that. That's what I say. Cool. Um, all right. So 
tell us whether you got them out of the mall or wherever you got them. Tell us about a couple of your success stories, people that you met. And I want to really hear the nitty gritty of the story. Like, how did you meet them? What were they doing for a living? What did you say to them? What was their response? And then what kind of success did they have in Arbonne? So do you have a couple of success stories that you can tell us? Like from inception to change of life today? Let me see. I'm thinking about my leaders that I have today. Um... Because a lot of my leaders aren't the people that I originally sponsored. But let me think for a second. So I did sponsor someone um, who I met at, I, mean, I think I'm this particular woman I met at a pet store. And, she, and it was, it was easier for me to talk to her because I knew she loved pets. And because our company was vegan even before it was called vegan. Right. I got to talk to her about, you know, the importance of animals and, and, I, and I, I said, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that do animal testing. You know, I'm really proud of the fact that my company doesn't do any animal animal testing. And um, so wh what do you do? She said, well, I market a Swiss skincare product line. And um, it's, it's pure, it's safe, it's clean. It's, it's a, a wonderful product line. As a matter of fact, and I used to say that a lot, as a matter of fact, I'd love to give you some, some samples to try if you'd like. And she said... Um, she goes, great. That's great. And I said, great. Mike, can I come back and see you tomorrow? We'll be working tomorrow. She said, yes. So I came the next day and, um, I brought her some products to try. And, um, and then I invited her to get together to have a cup of coffee, to talk about the business because she, I said to her at some point, um, cause we, we did go out for a coffee at, you know, so I could explain how, how to use the products. Right. And I said to her, so let me ask you a question. How, you know, how much longer are you going to be working at this, in this job? Have you ever thought about maybe having your own business? And she said, no, I never really thought about it. I said, well, I didn't think about it either. I was introduced to this business this way. I said, and I'd love to tell you more. We're actually having a meeting next Thursday night. I'd love you to come. And she came and um, she was, she was intrigued enough to come to the meeting I think I picked her up actually. I think I remember teaching people if they're not a passenger right. in your car, they're not going to get there. Right. <laughs> yeah. She came to the meeting with me and we, we had a little, you know, a little Arbon Discover Arbon meeting and she signed up to become a consultant. And um, I think she went on to, she, she didn't go on to become a big business builder, but again, it's such a long time ago. But I do recall that she did get to the level, um, you know, the first level where you're earning, you know, about $1,000 a month. So that was one, that was one story. And did she lead you to somebody? Yeah. She, I don't remember. She led me to a, a superstar. I'm trying to think. So, of, somebody led you to some superstars because you got yes, them in your business. I do. I have several superstars in my business. Um, I remember, I remember I met someone. Um, I, it's funny. I, I, I met a woman. At, I met, I did talk to a lot of waitresses back in those days. Yep. And, let me see. Oh, oh here's, a super, here's someone who led me to a superstar. I, I'm going back 26 years. I've got to remember. Right. So I was taking an acting class. So I was still pursuing the acting thing. And there was a woman who was always going after the same parts that I was going for. We had the same, you know, that mom look. And I did introduce her to the products. I, sitting, I think we're in a, an acting class together. And I said, um, are you, have you ever thought about, let me try to remember how I said it to her because it's a long time ago. Um, I think I said to her, oh, I know, I complimented people a lot on their skin back in those days because we only had skincare uh -huh. and nutrition. Yep. That's so, a good move. So I was always very, um, and I was always authentic about it. I would not tell someone who had, you know, a face full of pimples but right. what beautiful skin they had. But I said to this gal, you know, you really have beautiful skin. May I ask what you're using on your skin? And she told me, and I said, oh, I, and that's when I used, I noticed that in my business. I said, you have beautiful skin. I noticed that in my business. Mm -hmm. And she said, "What's your business?" I said, "I market a, you know, um, a botanical Swiss skincare product line." And she said, "Oh, really? I, I might be interested." Oftentimes, those days, people said, "I might be interested." Right. So I said, "Well, I'd love to give you some." And I think with this particular woman, I said, "Maybe you can come. Why don't you come by my house?" Because you know, I didn't know her that well, but she was my right. after class. When you come by my house, we can do a little facial because we did facials back in those days. So she did, she came over to the house. I did a self-guided facial with her. She decided to buy the products and she became a consultant. 
Now, fast forward a few months later, she had a friend down in Orange County who wanted to buy the products. And then this gal, the actress, decided not to do the business anymore. Wow. She said to her friend, why don't you call Donna? She's the, one, the person that was showing me what to do. And that was uh, Sally Hallida, who's today still in my business. And Sally has a success line of several national vice presidents, which is our top level. Wow. So that's, mi- that's, that's millions of dollars a year in sales volume from somebody who quit, who had a customer that they didn't even stick around to service the customer. Nice. Have you ever shown that gal who quit, the acting coach, how much money she left on the table? Um, she, oh, the girl that, I, uh, that girl actually, so funny, both of those people, the person who sponsored me who quit and the person that um, Sally talked to, both of them came back in again under us. <laughs> but they never had success. And they didn't right. have success because they didn't have a vision. So what are some of the things, Donna, that, that you have learned? You've been doing this for decades. You've, you've seen a lot of things come and go in our profession, a lot of product lines, a lot of companies, a lot of marketing themes. You've had a lot of things happen in your company in 38 years, Yes. which you know, people that are new to the profession, they tend to think, What's going on in my company today is what's always going to be going on. And so if they get involved and the company's growing really fast, they think, well, that's always going to be the way it is. Or whoever the president is will always be the president. Or however the product is packaged, that's always the way it's going to be packaged. And so when you're around for 25 years, you see a lot of different looks. And so. To talk to people about, like, how do you, there's not very many people, Donna, that I meet and talk to that are successful network marketers that have been doing it for 25 years. People, I mean, that, that's the, the profession, you know, 25 years ago was a really small profession, weren't very many people in it, and most of the people that got in it quit. So what had you not only survive, but prosper? back then when things were totally different and then prosper all the way through these different looks and gyrations in the profession? Well, I think because I came to the business already with some personal development under my belt, I think it helped me because I already understood the power of doing affirmations and setting goals and having a clear vision. That really helped me. Yep. And then I learned that no didn't mean no and I didn't take it personally because I've had Many people say no to me, and I've had people who got to the top level who walked away. So there were several times in the course of my business that I had to kind of regroup and reevaluate and and make some changes. So I've done that over the years. I've never, I've always reached out for help and support. I've always, I've always loved working with a coach. I love to be accountable. It really helped me. And you know, I think I think what really helped me was. I think what really helped me was never losing sight of, of my of the vision of what I could create if I just if I just stuck to it. And by the way, yeah. it took me in my company, I got to the to the level what we call the four year career level. Mm-hmm. I got there in eighteen months, but then it took me another eight years to get to that top level. And yeah. those eight years I had a lot of personal development to, to go through. Right. All right. So you, the first thing you talked about was vision and affirmations. So tell us about that. You've been doing that a long time. You were doing it even before you got involved in network marketing. What does that actually mean? And what does it do for you? I, I, tell people exactly how it helped you. Well, I'll, let me tell you how I was first introduced to affirmations, if that's okay. Yep. So, so many years ago, when I was in my 20s, I was very overweight. And I was very depressed. I wasn't very happy. And I went to a therapist who had recommended that book by Shakti Gawain. Mm -hmm. He taught me the power of writing affirmations. And you know how we talk about vision boards today and dream boards. And she actually had me cut out pictures of women who were thin, like thin bodies in magazines and had me put my face on them. Right. Yeah. Visualize that. And she taught me the power of affirmations. 
And so I knew that when I started to do my business, that if I, and, and by the way, the first book I read when I came into Arbonne was Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, because I was afraid to call some of those cold leads. Right. The second book I read was Think and Grow Rich. And Think and Grow Rich matched perfectly with what I learned about the law of attraction. And so I followed Napoleon Hill's formula and I wrote my affirmations the way he taught me how to do them with his book. And I've been a student of, of affirmations from the very beginning. And it really helped me continue. I often had to change my, my goal. You know, I'd always set a good, great, and awesome goal for myself. And there were times over those eight years that I didn't hit my goal. But I, I just, you know, just uh, I regrouped and found another path. So speak to that. So specifically, like if I'm somebody that I don't know a lot about affirmations or I've tried them, I've read a couple of those books, or I'm thinking about reading a couple of those books, what specifically does that work do for you? What's the benefit for you in building a business? So it's not it's not the affirmation that's valuable. It's what the affirmation does. It's what the vision does. So what did it do for you? Well, I, it kept it kept me um, it kept me clear on my on my vision of what I had to do. Especially when I woke up every morning and did it. So I started my day with the intention of finding people to share this business with that I could. I looked at it as a gift. I was giving them a gift. So and I I learned quickly to write the affirmation in the present tense as if it already happened. Um, not, I will be a national vice president. I am a national vice president. Right. I'm building a strong business. I'm a sponsoring magnet. I sponsor dynamic, coachable, high-powered leaders to my team. That was my affirmation. So by starting my day with an affirmation that was said in the present tense, then I just, I feel like I attracted people into my world. That's just how the law of attraction works. And it's funny because I just did a training this weekend for 145 people on the same topic, so telling people this is not magic. This is, this is science. We have, you know, a reticular activating system in our brain that will, that will match what we're looking for if we focus and have that clear intention. So I did that every day. Beautiful. Okay. And then you said, I learned to mean that no doesn't mean no. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I would always circle back to people if they said no to me. I'd get permission. You know, I'd say, Richard, if it, I understand it's not a good time right now, but can, can I check back with you in a, in a few months and see if maybe your circumstances might have changed? And they gave me permission, and I did. And back in those days, you know, I had to pick up the phone and call people. Right. And because I was getting so many leads, I had so many leads, because I would get 10 leads every day, just wherever, just out and about. I, I used to, I had an old composition notebook and I wrote down people's names, you know, on the, in the composition notebook. And I left that composition notebook by the phone in the kitchen, the phone, by the way, that had the cord. <laughs> right. Yeah. And every time I walked past that phone, every time I called someone, because, you know, I'd go get my kids a snack, I'd call someone. So I really fit this into the nooks and crannies of my life. And I knew that this was a numbers game. I knew I had to just keep calling people. And so I, I wasn't disappointed if they said no. I just kept calling. When you call somebody, Donna, what what typically would you say to them? Um, hi, Richard. This is Donna Weiser Hennis calling. If you recall, we met yesterday at the mall. And I remember you had a cute little boy who was uh, wearing that little blue hat because I'd write that down in my notes. Mm -hmm. I said, and I, I was calling to follow up on our conversation. I'd love to invite you to a get-together I'm having at my home next Thursday. Love you to come. That's what and I'm, how many how many yeses versus noes would you get from those phone calls? Probably every ten, maybe two or three yeses. Yeah. And out of those two or three yeses, maybe one would show up. Right. And how many calls would you make a day? Oh gosh, I I made at least ten calls a day, but sometimes more because if my goal was to you know get yeses, I had to keep calling. And right. I got better at it, of course, as time went on. Yep. Beautiful. All right. So let's move to leadership. Um, so you said it took you eight years. Was that to go from RVP to NVP? Yes. Okay. So RVP is like, you know, five, 6,000 a month in income and NVP is 20, average, 25. Average, average 23. 
Yeah. MVP. Um, so RVP is kind of, I mean, that's very successful. There's, you know, if, if a hundred people join Arbon and you track them, you know, there's not that many that would get to RVP as in the case of every company, $5,000 a month is very good network marketing income. Unfortunately, as you know, too many people go full time and then they're broke like everybody else because five grand a month full time is nothing. But five grand a month part time, that's awesome. I mean, you could invest that and be a millionaire in, you know, six, seven years or something. Um, but MVP, that's rock star income. Yes. That's that's get wealthy income. That's you know, pay off your home and, and invest in real estate and send your kids to any college you want to send them to and travel the world first class. That's, that's great income. Yes. So the, the eight year period that you went from RVP to NVP, what did you learn about leadership in those eight years, empowerment, motivation, enablement of people? Um, what did you learn about people quitting? What did you learn about you? That had to be a massive transformational eight years for you. Yeah, it was. And I, it really was all about the personal development. I had to stop being, um, I had to stop micromanaging people. That was one of the big lessons I had to learn. So say was, more about that. What does that look like? I was trying to do everything for everyone. and I. And it was exhausting. And it was exhausting. So I kind of felt like a hamster, you know, on a hamster wheel. Yep. And I was so tired doing that. And when I finally studied John Maxwell and learned the power of a leadership and learning how important it is to, um, to inspire other people and give them a chance to, to show up as leaders, that's when things turned around for me. Mm -hmm. And I... Nope. I but I also had to, you know, roll up my sleeves because I lost people. I had to roll up my sleeves and get back, you know, and and, and work again myself and, and build, build my central, if you will. Right. Yep. Build the core of your business again. Right. So when you said uh, quit micromanaging people, let people do things for themselves, can you give us a couple of specific examples of the kinds of things that you would do for people? Because I suppose you were afraid that they wouldn't do them unless you did them. Yes. But and then there's that period where, so if, if I'm leading you and so you probably have said, oh, Richard, will you do this for me? I'm not sure I can do it. I need help. You know, you, you might have been one of those people that would email me and say, you know, where's the compensation plan? <laughs> you know? And in the beginning, we would, you know, send them a link to the compensation plan. Oh, here it is right here, Donna. Here, yep. here it is. And, and then later you have this epiphany and and your response is it's on the website yes. or your response is even more empowering which might be go figure it out for yourself right. <laughs> so give us some examples of things that you would do for people that then you would pass the baton and it's the passing the baton that's scary because you don't know if it's going to get dropped you, in fact, you got to let it drop. Right. So you, have, you have some examples of that? Well, I'm thinking about the, we'd have meetings, you know, either in-home meetings or meetings at hotels. And I I had to always be the one on the front. Didn't give people a chance to show up as leaders. You're the movie but, star. Well, I know. But that, <laughs> <laughs> that was a my business. Um, I, so the same so thing you with, let people get in front of the room, and that had to be scary because – in the beginning, they're horrible. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. so I had to, and then I learned to coach them before they got from the front. That was, oh, good. So I was able to say, well, let's talk about what you're going to say. And, you know, then letting them, you know, say it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the same thing happened with um, whenever there, oh, if there was a, a newsletter that I did, and we did, hand, you know, newsletters, but we had to print it, Kinko's and <laughs> mail out to people. Right, yeah. And, I did it all myself. I did everything myself. I didn't let anyone do anything. And um, when it came time for working with their team, I was, you know, busy getting involved with their other teams, you know, trying to 
maybe I need to meet with them because you won't be able to meet with them. You won't, you don't have the right skills yet to meet with them. And that's the kind of thing I, I was doing. And um, that wasn't very helpful mm-hmm. for them. Right. It wasn't creating leaders. I was, you know, creating really good followers. Yep. So in that eight years, um, if I were to ask you, what's the smartest thing that you did during that eight years? Would it be that you learned to let go and empower and trust and risk leadership development? Yeah, I think that was a big part of it. And I, and honestly, the other part was that I, I had to get out there and I had to sponsor up. All right, talk about that. That's a biggie. So, you know, I love those little um, I have those little nesting dolls, you know, the one that's the big one and the small one inside and the small one and the small one. So there's four of them, right? Yeah. So because I didn't feel confident in myself and some of the old issues I had, um, you know, my worthiness issues, which which is, you know, old, old history stuff, it still kind of showed up. And so I felt very comfortable sponsoring someone who was waiting tables or someone yep. who was serving me at the department store. I didn't feel comfortable reaching out to people who are already successful. So how did you change that mental game? How, what did you, what kind of new story did you tell yourself that eased you into being able to do that? I did. I had to tell myself a new story. So I wrote a new story. I literally created a, a new dream board with, I, I can see it like it was yesterday. I had, Doctors with uh, on my dream board. I had doctors with stethoscopes. I had, you know, I had lots of different professions, professional people on that dream board. My affirmations changed to the kind of people I wanted to sponsor into my business. And I got really scared, but I did it anyway. I picked up the phone and I called people who I I was afraid to call. So I, I learned to feel the fear even at that point in my business. And I did call my doctor to sit down with my doctor. And I called my CPA and I sat down with my CPA. And Donna, who was, you know, just starting the business, never would have done that. So I had to have the courage to do that. And I realized they're just people like me. Yeah, they're just struggling financially at a higher level. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but interesting, so, once, once, once I did that, it just kind of snowballed. Yeah. Yep. So what's the biggest mistake that you made going from RVP to NVP or maybe post NVP? What's the biggest mistake you've made in your Arbonne career leadership wise? And maybe it was an economic mistake or maybe it was a health or maybe it was an integrity or relationship. Maybe it was a one-time blunder or maybe it was a bad habit. What's the biggest thing, mistake you've made from RVP and on? I think the biggest mistake was trying to convince people that they should grow their business or convince them that they were worthy of getting to the top or trying to, um, to coach the wrong people. Instead of yes. letting go and letting them be and just looking for someone else who who wanted this. Mm-hmm. So you know, working with the wrong people, that you know, that didn't work. You know, Jerry Roisentool is one of my coaches and he has a great analogy. He talks about the people on the bench and the people who are on the field. And he, you don't see the coach, you know, facing the bench and ch- cheering them on in the middle of the game. <clears throat> I think I was doing that for a long time. I was cheering the people on the bench. And yeah, so push, pushing field. ropes. Say it again? Sometimes it's called pushing ropes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you so can't. So imagine that. you got a rope laid out and you're trying to push it. That's how frustrating it is to coach people who don't want to be coached or motivate people who are committed to not being motivated. Yeah. And I also had to stop being people's therapists. That, you know, yeah. that was that was really that was hard for me because I saw so much greatness in people. I still do. To this day, I see so much greatness in people and they don't see it in themselves and I just get so darn frustrated. Like, why don't you see how amazing you are? They don't see it and I can't convince them. Well, you've convinced some. Yeah. 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 Just just by your life and your role model. So as we wrap this up, Donna, what what's going on for you now? What are you doing in Arbonne now? I mean, a lot of people might have been retired a long time ago. Um, 
are you retired? Are you going to retire? What's the vision for the future? Well, thanks to your help and support, I actually wrote a letter to my key leaders this past month, let them know that I'm going to be pulling back. I'm not going to, I'm only going to be working four days a week. And I, t- and I let them know the days I'm working and I'm going to take those other three days and just enjoy the heck out of my new granddaughter and, and, um, and golf with my husband and, you know, learn some new skills and have fun and enjoy this wonderful, you know, in- income that I'm blessed to have because I, I have been, I've been working. Uh, so listen, I love what I do. Yeah. I love what I do, but the reality is I have to shut it off sometimes, you know, and that phone, it can be, um, you know, can be, uh, I, 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 I don't know. My husband's walking by. He, there are times he'll say to me, "Enough with the phone, already." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I say yeah. it a lot more than off not. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we're in the people business, and uh, there's thousands of people on your team, and everybody wants to talk to you, and everybody wants to listen to you, and everybody's looking for support, and everybody's in a different time zone, and so. The smart thing you're doing there, Donna, is creating some boundaries because you've you earned the right to create boundaries years ago, many years ago, and so you're you know most of your people they're on their own. They have great leaders. They don't need you. They want you, but they don't really need you. And you're having a lot of fun in the business, so you keep doing the business, but doing it on your terms. Yes, which is. The store is open four days a week, and this is when the store is open. It's not open at 11 o'clock at night. And um, that's a great example for you to show other people because that's what you want them to be doing, you know, five or 10 years from now to enjoy what they've built. What's the point of building an asset income if you don't enjoy it to do things besides work, right? Exactly. There's no point in piling up ranks and piling up income unless you can enjoy it and live life to its fullest. Yes, yes. Which I I know you guys are doing. Yes, thank you. Beautiful thing. Thank you. All right, so um, sometimes we turn the tables. I'm going to turn the tables on you. You you know me well enough. We've worked together close enough. You might have a, a question most people don't ask me. Do you want to end this interview, turn the tables, you ask me a question? Yeah, I'd love to ask you a question. I would like to ask you, um, what when you're, when you're out meeting people, I know you're so good at this, when you're out meeting people and you don't, and you don't find the, um, there isn't a connection, you don't make a connection, do you just let it go or do you keep looking for the connection? Do you stay in touch with them? I, that's what I love to know. Okay, well, what I mean by... Uh, connection is um, if if the conversation can go to the place of we trade contact information then then I call that a connection so are you asking what about people that I meet that the conversation doesn't go to that point do I stay after them well, it's interesting because when I, when, you know, I, I've learned so much from you. And back in the old days when I was building with the cold market, my intention was to come home with at least 10 names every single day. And, and I, t- I brought up Arbonne to all, uh, immediately. Yes. And perhaps if I had learned from you what you teach, I might not have come home with 10 names, but I might, but I might have come home with three really good names. Yes. What you would have incorporated into your posture and your identity and the way people saw you is they would have seen you as a beautiful human being that they met that has a lot to offer them that could be fun. You know, we might play golf. We might have coffee. We might do girl talk. We might talk about marketing. We might talk about acting. Um, And, oh, I found out some point later which might be the first time you talk to him, and it might be the tenth time you talk to him. But and she's got this really cool product line in business. That's that's probably the difference between what I teach people today and what you and I both did 
25 years ago. So when I'm out meeting people, I think about connections and I think about serving people and I think about knowing people more than I think about recruiting them. I'm always present to the opportunity. I'm always listening for the clues that you might give that you're a candidate either for the products or the opportunity, but I'm not in a hurry. And I think that's, you know, one of the differences between us 25 years ago and us today is, well, one, we can afford not to be in a hurry, but two, I mean, I would have even coached me 25 years ago, look, you're better off going and getting a full-time job and doing this on a part-time basis than going out into the marketplace desperate to make a living from network marketing or to achieve your goals. Even going out into the marketplace desperate to achieve your goals leaves people with a certain feeling like, well, if I'm not interested in his business right now, then I'm, I don't have a place in this guy's life. And so I, I would coach people, be patient. That doesn't mean procrastinate. Patience is not procrastination. Patience is with an individual. And the way I compensate for being patient with an individual is to have lots of individuals in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. So the number of people that you went out and connected with, 10, like 10 people a day, that's a lot. That is a huge number of people. And, and you know, look at the numbers like this. If you connected with 10 people a day, and let's say those are not very good connections. They're mostly clerks and they're, you know, they're not entrepreneurs. They don't have money. They don't have time. They don't have high self-esteem. And you did not develop a quality relationship with them. You kind of just pitched them right off the back. So let's say out of those 10 people, there's only one that is a really good connection, is is a really good candidate. Well, what I would do is, let's say, have two. What if you had two really good connections every day? You know, our friend uh, Tom Chenault teaches, you know, I teach people, invite one people a day. Tom teach people teaches people, go connect with two people a day. But if you look at either one of those scenarios and you look at them over a 30-day period and you look at the numbers, if you connect with two people a day, that's 60 people a month. 60 people a month with a quality connection, meaning, you know, your posture and your state of being with those two people is not, you're not in a hurry. With 60 people, you don't need to be in a hurry with any one of them individually because you have 60 people. That's a lot of people in a month. In fact, I'm not even sure how you'd follow up with that many people. And so the secret is be patient with the individual, but how you accomplish your goals is have a lot of people in the pipeline. And you don't get a lot of people in the pipeline by hurrying and, you know, taking on things like 10 people a day. I mean, it. That's, that's, you are exceptional. I would never coach people to talk to 10 people a day. I would neither. Because, yeah, only one out of a thousand people are ever going to do that. And what's more important than 10 people a day is two people a day for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Because anybody that says, oh yeah, I'll talk to 10 people a day. Well, you and I know they're going to last about four days. Right before they burn out on that, they can't keep it up. And then they broke their promise and then they feel bad about themselves. So I think what you and I would coach anybody to do is rather than pick a big number, pick a small number and do it every day. Mm-hmm. Even if, it, if it's one invite a day and, and an invite is just asking somebody to take a look at your business and they answer you, Most people would not consider that to be a big pace, but if you did that every day for 30 days, you have 30 people that are considering looking at your business or not, and and that's more activity than 99% of the people that have ever been in Arbonne. It's huge, but it's only huge because you did it for 30 days, and then you do it for another 30 days and another 30 days. 
And how long do you need to keep up that pace? Until your business rolls into momentum. Until you get enough people in your business that, that you're not driving your business, it's driving you. And that might take a year. It might take 18 months. Uh, and you don't have to talk. You don't have to do it every day, every week, every month. You know, if, if somebody talked to one person a day or two people a day and they did it for a month and then they took a month off and then did it for another month and took a month off and did it for another month, took a month off, they'd still do more than 99% of the people that have ever joined ever any network marketing company. It really doesn't take much effort to be extraordinary in our business, what it takes is consistency because it's the consistent person that piles up the relationships, the conversations, the connections. It's kind of like, you know, the example in the four-year career, if you take a penny and you double it every day for a month, it's over $5 million. But if you double it every other day, it's only $163. And so that's the difference between people that make this work and people that don't. It's not how fast they go. It's not how many people they talk to every day. It's how consistent they are. And when you're consistent over a big enough period of time, even 30, 60 days is a huge chunk of time, it allows you the opportunity to be patient with people, to listen to people, to serve people. So when I'm out connecting with people, I'm not looking for the first opportunity to recruit them. I'm actually looking for the first opportunity to serve them. And here's how I might serve somebody. Um, I might edify them on their social media page, you know, two or three or four or five times, which would be comment, you know, say something nice or respond to something they're doing on social media. I might connect to people. So if I'm prospecting you or you're a connection of mine and you're an aspiring actress and I know a casting agent, I'm going to connect you. That's serving people. Serving people is also being present to them. So instead of taking the time that we have together to pitch you, I'm going to take the time that we have together to get to know you because that actually serves you. People want to be known. They want to be accepted. They want to be edified. They want to be championed. And so I'd rather spend my time doing that with you than recruiting you because I'm patient, because I have a lot of people in the pipeline, because I'm talking to people every day. And when you're patient and you serve people, they will tell you, here's exactly how and when you can recruit me. They will tell you what's going on in their life that's missing. They will tell you the problem they have in their life they can't solve and they have never been able to solve it. And it's crushing them. And it might be a pain point. Or it might be a pleasure point. It might be like, you know, the number one passion I have in the world is surfing. Like I'm in Noosa, Australia for three months, living and building and working, and I'm learning how to surf here. It's one of the things that I'm doing here. So two or three times a week, I go out with a coach and I learn how to surf. But this is like the surfing capital of Australia, Noosa. And people live here just to surf. And it is painful. For people to live here whose passion is surfing, if they can't get out and surf. And so when you serve people and you're patient and you get to know them, they'll tell you things like, my passion is surfing. I love to surf. And so you might ask them, well, how often do you get to surf? And they might tell you, not often enough. So then you might ask them, why not? Mm-hmm. Why don't you surf every day? And, you know, they're, they're going to say something. They're going to answer that question. Somehow that's tied to money. Right. It's not tied to the weather. It's not tied to 
yeah, they have other things they have to do, but a lot of the other things they have to do, they could hire somebody else to do. You know, if the guy says, well, I'd love to surf, but I can't because I got to mow the lawn. Well, great. I know how to get your lawn mowed for free so you could go surf. You want to hear about that? <laughs> See, what I do, Donna, is I wait until I know exactly how to offer Arbon, so they can't say no. Right. But if you offer Arbon in the first 10 minutes you're talking to them, you're going to step all over yourself, right? Because... And that's why, that's why we, I had to get 10 names a day. Cause I was like, in this big, big hurry, uh, you know, because right. <laughs> right. and, and I, I truly believe it. I'm sure you do too, that it's, it's easier today with social media. It's easier today with texting. It was in those days we had, I got 10 names. I had to call 10 people. You think I reached right. people? Of course not. <laughs> On the phone. And of course, you know, even 25 years ago, you know, people, you get a busy signal 25 years ago and you have to call them back or I, yeah, I, people. I spoke to the lady who gave me, I asked her for her number on the back of my business card and she gave me her pager. And I called her, I called this lady for six months. Hi, it's Donna. I met you last week. Hey, it's Donna. I met you a few weeks ago. Hey, it's Donna. But I called her for six months. And I'll tell you, this is the truth. She said to me after six months, she finally called me. She said, were you ever going to stop calling me? I said, well, you said you were interested. But that's what I did. I, I was totally persistent. And I know that everybody's not like that. Well, I say, uh, here's why I want to wrap this up, Donna. I say the secret to your success is that early on, not sure how or why, but early on, you had the intuition, the curiosity, the motivation to learn about motivation, to learn about transformation, to learn about manifestation. And you studied. And you didn't just study. You know, I've had a lot of people study my stuff, but they don't do anything about it. And you not only studied, but you put what you learned into action. And by doing that, you changed how you thought about things. And one of the things that you changed, or at least you enhanced, was your commitment, your persistence, your optimism. The way you saw your Arbonne career was, if I do the work, this is going to work. And, you know, the number one thing that I found that keeps people from doing the work is not because they can't. Anybody can do this work. It's because they don't believe it's going to pay off. Mm. And you believed it would pay off. But that's a story you told yourself that you chose to believe. And that is, that's a remarkable place to be that so, so few people ever get to is taking responsibility for changing what you believe, changing what you tell yourself, changing what's true for you, changing who you are, changing how you go about doing things. And you did that early on. I say that's, that's, the, that's the remarkable aspect of your career. And is responsible from you going from a scared, broke, starving actress and camp director with a four-year degree in camp directing <laughs> to a multimillionaire. It's a beautiful story. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for asking me to share tonight. Yep. Hey, everybody. We're way over time. So uh, thank you for joining us. Another hero call, number 96, Donna Weiser Hennis, Woodland Hills, California. That's just the first 25 years. We'll check in with her 25 <laughs> years from now. <laughs> See how many more millionaires she's created. Thank you all for joining us. Over and out.